Is it Wednesday? Today is Wednesday, right? It is. It's Wild Wednesday. Hi, everybody. Wild, wonderful hump day Wednesday. <laughs> Somehow hump day didn't go with wild and wonderful, but it really is. Hey, everybody. It's Liz Dawn coming to you from Celebrate Your Life. And today I have a fabulous guest. And I think, I think what we should do today, Kate, is we're going to sing the interview because Kate is a Broadway actress, singer, vocalist, creator extraordinaire, and she is a life coach, and she is the best-selling author of the book called A Pixie's Prescription, A Fun Toolkit for a Feel Better Life. A Fun Toolkit for a Feel Better Life. I love that! Yeah. Kate was just telling me that she was she was just working on um you were working on a music video yesterday. For yes. So I sing for Broadway Inspirational Voices, which is a wonderful organization that uh we not only sing gospel music, but we've done a bunch of um moving into different styles as well. But we work for Ronald McDonald House and Covenant House doing outreach programs. And so yesterday I was recording a video for what's called Songs in the Key of Me. And it's a great program that we do with Ronald McDonald House. And I was uh, playing a flight attendant. You're playing a flight attendant. That yes. is fabulous. And you've like, you've worked with some of the greats in, you know, I'm so fascinated because I was in the theater a gazillion years ago and you still are. And then so fascinated by your career as an actress and by your career as a Broadway performer and a vocalist and now a life coach and a best-selling author. So many talents and a pixie prescription person. So yeah, if you're here, say hello to us in the comments. Hi, Karen. Good to see you here, Karen. If you're here watching us today, give us a shout. Say, hey, Kate, we want to hear you sing. <laughs> okay, what was your all-time favorite, favorite, favorite Broadway show that you were ever in? Okay, favorite. the what? Okay, so they were all very different, and and it's always like a different. It's so funny because sometimes the time that the shows came out would make the shows a different experience than you know if I did it at a different time, right? So the one that I was in for the longest, and it, I think that I learned the most about myself throughout was Mary Poppins. <gasps> Mary Poppins. Poppins. Mary Poppins. And who did you play in Mary Poppins? Everybody but Mary. Everybody but I love it. <laughs> so you played Wendy, you played, let's see. <laughs> I was, so when I first went into the show, I went into the, sh the role of Miss Lark. Okay. And she has the little dog uh, that barks at people. And, uh, and then I also understudied the Bird Woman and um, Miss Andrew, who's not in the movie, but she's the evil character in the book, and Mrs. Brill, the housekeeper. Oh, I just love it. So that was my first job. And I was there for about three it. months just for a leave of absence. And then uh, <laughs> the, the, the song Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious has a lot of dance moves that are very intricate to teach uh -huh. and, they, and they took a very long time to teach. So when the woman playing Mrs. Corey, who leads that number, got in a car accident, they needed somebody immediately to come in to play that, that role who knew those letters. And so I got a call and was just kind of in the show then as that character. And oh, then wow. for that character, somebody else hurt her knee. And so then I went to that character. You got bugs over there? I do have something over at my desk. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Go away. <laughs> You're being infested. <laughs> I know. Don't mind me as I sit here with the interviewer, like, smelling her arms and shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to be in danger there. Are you okay? <laughs> I'm totally good now. If it comes back again, you'll see. I was trying to be so subtle. <laughs> it was, it was good. It was good. It was good. <laughs> Only with you, Kate. <laughs> okay, but let's talk about the pix 
Pixie's prescription. Okay. So, so at my end of the contract of Mary Poppins, I completed a 100 pound weight loss. And it, yeah. And it's sort of. Wow. Well, well, let's take that in for a second. You completed, that's a person. Uh, yep. yep. That's amazing. It was a really interesting two and a half year journey. It was a really, it was a really long journey. Um, somebody asked, why are we laughing? Because um, Liz was being infested by bugs. He's okay. It was, and I was trying to be very subtle and wave the bug away. And then the next thing you know, I was like, <laughs> I was wrestling with this little teeny tiny bug flying in my face. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So let's go back to the 100 pound, 100 pound weight loss. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, okay. but. But so it sort of destroyed my Broadway career. It's, it destroyed your Broadway. Oh, because you were. I was a type. You were a type. You were this character actress and yep. you were playing certain roles. And now all of a sudden you weren't that. Right. That character anymore. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. And so I was in Mary Poppins for about a good year and a half as my very thin self. So it didn't affect that particular job, but I couldn't get another job after that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to remain heavy in order to work on Broadway. Is that the deal? <laughs> well, apparently it didn't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because it hasn't happened to We're the ingenue or we are the character. Okay. Right. Got it. Got right. it. Okay. And now, and now I'm getting older, which is on my side for the character. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But what I would really love is if Broadway would start to produce shows about more than just archetypical women. That would be really nice. <gasps> Maybe we need to write them. I am writing that. I'm working oh, on it right now. Love it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have many script ideas, by the way, for my days in being in theater. Well, then we should talk. We should just yeah. talk. We should just yeah. talk. Wouldn't you? I would love to know everybody out there listening. Wouldn't you just love to write a script? Wouldn't you love to like? Why do? Because I love reading plays. Like, give me a play any day, any place, and I could just read scripts and read scripts. I just love reading scripts. Yeah, it's fun. It's reading a good time. So, Pixie's prescription. So, so I didn't have a career, and I and I needed to do something, and so I went to learn to be a health coach, and then I got my master's in holistic medicine, and then. Uh, I wanted to write a book. And so I think somewhere in the middle of that, I wrote the book. Um, and then, uh, yeah. What is it about? So tell me, what is Pixie's Prescription for Life about? So everybody wanted to know what I did to lose the weight and keep it off. Okay. And really what it was is I, I filled my life with a lot of things that weren't necessarily food. But when it was food, I made sure that I gave myself really high quality food that my body was asking for and that would nourish me instead of anesthetize me. Got it. And um, so like the, the chapters are things about curiosity or play or re, um, home environment or education or re, uh, relationships. Ooh. And so each chapter highlights these, <laughs> you and your bugs. <laughs> I wish there was a chapter on how to get rid of bugs. I don't and know. It's coming back and it's in my face. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's our gnat of a pool. I'm so sorry. Okay, so let's go back to this. So, so uh, I wrote these little short stories about different, you know, things in my life, like working with Marvin Hamlish. He taught me how to play. Um. <clears throat> Meeting a Congolese rebel, I wrote about that in Uganda Ooh. and um, what that taught me. And then I also offer like little actionable practice things that you can do to keep play as part of your life mm -hmm. and to cultivate a really good sense of play that uh, works really well. Because a lot of times adults lose the sense of play. It's been kind of beaten out of us culturally. Yeah. Um, and so this gets to you know have it come back in, in a nice gentle free way. And then there's some recipes of some really delicious, nutritious yumminess that uh, people in my world have made these things for them and they've asked for the recipes. So I put those in the book. Oh, this just sounds, you're right. It's a Pixie's prescription for life. I just love it. And so what kinds of, because I love when you talk about play, because I, I'm i all about playfulness and playing and accessing my little kid, as you can tell, and all that. Yeah, that's why I was <laughs> drawn to you. I was like, 
oh, this is somebody I know. Maybe I'm supporting. Aha, uh -huh, the one of, oh, Eric wants, has a question. He says, have fun, ladies, get that bug. I would love to know what she thought about this movie I am supporting, The One of Now. We will watch it. We will have look you seen, it. Have you seen The One of Now? I haven't seen The One of Now. I haven't heard about it, Eric, but I'll, I'm all over watching movies. I'll take a look at it. Yeah. I love it. Anyway, so, um, so play. We talk about play, and I'd love to know from all of you watching and hanging out with us today, what do you do for play? So give us some suggestions, because sometimes I feel like the well has dried up, and I don't know what to do today, and all I want to do is play, and I can't think of anything to do. So suggestions from our, from our viewers, suggestions from you, Kate. What do we do to play? Okay, so the first thing that I would say comes to mind is to allow yourself to get really bored. If you think about when you were a kid and you were in class or in church or sitting around with a bunch of adults and they were telling stories that you didn't care about and you couldn't relate to and you get really bored, your mind would sort of travel off into this other space and you'd start to play in this world of imagination. And it was a self-preservation tactic. Mm -hmm. And as we get older, we don't allow ourselves to get so bored that we go into that place where our mind starts to entertain us. I do that. All the time. <laughs> All the time. Does that mean I have the mind of a five-year-old? No, it means that you have a playful mind. It means that you have a well-developed right brain. And that you do that all, like seriously, all the time. If I'm driving and I'm super bored, oh, let's make up a story. And I start making up stories in my head. And haven't you found that out of that play comes other things? Like it becomes like a chain reaction of things? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Vicky does that too. See? Yeah. Okay. We're not so weird after all. No, nope. nope. it. it's, really, it's a really great way to allow yourself to just kind of self-soothe in a way that that gets you back to who you are rather than who you were told to be when you were told to sit down and be quiet and to pay attention and to you know be engaged and all of those mm -hmm. all of those mm -hmm. things, right so that's the first thing that i would say is allow yourself to get bored you know right. be be in a place where you don't have your phone, there's no TV on, there's nothing to do other than you just have to sit still until your mind starts to take you into a, a place of play. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So then the other thing too is if you have any animals around you, just watch, uh, especially young animals, watch what they do with different things. Cats are fun to watch play. You can pull up cats on um, YouTube and just watch cats playing. And and you can see how they're, they're puzzling through like the next move and the next thing they're gonna do and how are they gonna solve the problem and how are they gonna get the one-upsmanship and how are they gonna keep the game going? Uh, the games mm -hmm. don't continue when somebody gets mean or somebody gets too serious or somebody gets their claws out, right? Right, right. That stops the game. The game continues as long as they're soft pawing each other and as long as, you know, it's all in good fun. Right. So I think that one of the things that we forget about is that really life is all in good fun. It, it feels heavy a lot oh, of the time. It does. Right now it does. It sure does. Yeah. And, I, and I know that we want to touch on being resilient today as well. So I'd love to touch on that. It's, it's all fun. wrapped in the same thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so when I was a, a young actress, I was very serious. I did not play at all. <laughs> I was a nightmare to work with, I think. You were a thespian. Yes, a very serious equity actress thespian. <laughs> yes, and I didn't, I, I didn't play with anybody for any reason. I have stories that still make me cringe where I'm like, oh, wow, playful would have been good there, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> And so when I met Marvin Hamlish, uh, who wrote a chorus line and, and a lot of famous songs. And, and I played he, Sheila. Yes. And he, yeah. passed, he passed away several years ago, which was very sad for the world, I think, and definitely for me. And But Marvin just always had like a way of coming into the room and lifting the, the vibe of the room. 
Mm -hmm. he, would, he had this um, fixation that he would play, like he'd play a bit and he'd keep that bit through the entire time that we were working together and he'd keep adding to it. So every day you knew that he was gonna come in, now I've got flies. Every day you knew that he was gonna come in and maybe say, um, he had this thing about the musical Bajour. Have you ever heard of it? Uh -uh. No, exactly. Nobody has heard of that musical except for really, truly hardcore musical theater fans. And even they, they're like, oh yeah, I think Seth I listened to that. would know what it is. <laughs> exactly, Seth would, totally. So, um, so Bajour is just this musical that was sort of a blip on the radar. And Marvin had a fascination about doing it in Pig Latin. Oh my gosh. He's like, that, we're not gonna do this musical. We were doing a musical called Sweet Smell of Success. He said, we're not gonna do this one. We're gonna do Bajour in Pig Latin. And so he'd come and he'd sit down at the table and he'd perform these songs that we didn't know because nobody knew Bajour, but they were from Bajour. And he would sing them in Pig Latin. Oh my gosh, that's and, great. Right? And then he would just leave. I love that you got to meet him and spend time with, I mean, Marvin Hamlish, how many people in this world can say, oh, I spent time with Marvin Hamlish listening to him play music from Bajor in Pig Latin. I mean, come on. You know what? It gets better than that, Liz John, because he was from my, he was born in my hometown. I was oh. not born there, but he was born there and he was not raised there. But just randomly, he was born in a little town in Ohio. and. Oh. Um, he, he was doing a concert in my hometown at the Ritz theater, which is where I grew up doing, um, community theater. Mm -hmm. And he called me and he asked me if I wanted to solo with him. <gasps> no. With Marvin Hamlish. Yeah. Oh, that is such an honor. Yeah. Oh, that is amazing. That's 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 like a, a once in a lifetime, like such treasured. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. So, needless to say, you said yes. I did say yes, you and I went. Um, and it was it was it was an experience that needed resilience, and I'll tell you that. Um. Three days before the concert, my father got very, very ill and went in for his third open heart surgery. Oh, wow. Okay. And it wasn't going well oh, because dear. there's a medication that he was very allergic to. And he told them not to give him that medication. And the doctors said, we know better. And they oh. gave it to him and it stopped his heart for five and a half minutes, which is a dangerous amount of time. Wow. And so at the time of the concert, I didn't know if my father was going to live or die. <gasps> um, and I was also in rehearsal to play Mrs. Claus for the Radio City Christmas Spectacular. <laughs> and, I, oh, that's great. and I was under so much stress that I couldn't remember what they would teach me from day to day. So you had a lot on your plate and you're singing with Marvin Hamlish. And, I wasn't, and okay. I wasn't digesting any of it very well, right? But what I learned in that moment, because again, Marvin was back in my life and here I was swirling in all this stress about the show and stress about my father and whatever. And Marvin said, come, let's have lunch. Take me to your favorite place. In my hometown, there are not very many options or there weren't at that time, uh, but, but we, we went to my favorite place and, and uh, he just made me laugh the whole time. And he just, he asked me briefly about how my dad was doing and I talked about it and he was very compassionate about it. And then he took it right back to let's find a way to play through this. I know your heart's broken, but let's, let's get this, you know, let's give this moment the enjoyment that it can have. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. It's absolutely yeah. beautiful. So how do you, so you teach a lot about resilience in your practice, okay, mm -hmm. as, as a life coach and as a teacher. So tell us a little bit about, especially right now, you know, we're, we're all tired. We're all tired of this whole COVID thing and being isolated and whatever else we're doing. I know some people aren't, some people are. I happen to be one of the R's, <laughs> isolating. So. My question is like, what, what like three tips can you give us to kind of get through those, this tough period of, of what we're going through to be more resilient, to keep ourselves intact, to maintain our balance, share, share, share. 
<laughs> okay, so I sort of had like a pre-COVID COVID experience because I was a long-term caregiver. And and that's sort of a thing where you don't really know when it's going to end. You don't know, you know, you're limiting the people that can come into your life for a lot of different reasons. Uh, you don't get, you know, time off from kind of the work of trying to keep the life going that you have before it's all that stuff. And I would get like little respites like this summer, we had a little respite where people kind of got out and moved around a little bit more freely than we're doing right now. And, mm -hmm. and I saw the same kind of things happen where people were happy for it and a little exhausted by it and a little confused by how some of it maybe felt on them now after all this time. Mm -hmm. And it's this whole mix of, I don't know where the ground is underneath me. And the answer is. And how many of you have felt, I just, I'm curious uh, the, for our viewers, how many of you have felt this way? Maybe the past year and a half or two years about you cannot even feel the ground beneath you, that everything is going so fast and you're feeling confused and upset. So I want to kind of check in with our audience to see if, how many of you have felt this way. All right. I'm sorry. Please keep, keep no, going. Um, so the answer is don't look for the ground. <laughs> I love it. Yes, Janice is saying, okay, Janice Peterson is here. Right? Don't yeah. look for the ground. It's not there. There's um there's a I think a Buddhist prophecy. I'm gonna get it wrong, uh, but it's something about um when 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 the universe wants to teach you somebody something, it takes your feet out from under you, and then it takes the ground, and then it takes something else, and it's like, and now we're getting somewhere. Right. Meaning that at the point when you don't have anything that you recognize, therein lies an opportunity for great beauty. Mm-hmm but it's hard to look at because it's something you've never seen before. And how do you get into that space of recognizing the great beauty when you're Meshuggah with the business is falling apart, my health, my life, my friends, my, you know, how do you, what are some tips to come through that? So a lot of it is about your gaze. When I was caring for my uncle, uh, I found myself in the first days making my my focus was on all that I had to do, all the things that were wrong, all the things that were bothersome. Mm -hmm. I found that when that was my focus, my days were long and heavy. And so I bought a billboard that was right outside of his window that used to face right into our the living room. It was a terrible billboard. And I put a piece of artwork up on it that just said love. Ah. <gasps> uh... And that shifted my gaze enough that every day I would leave my room and I would immediately see that billboard and it was loud. It was loud in that room. It was a big ass billboard coming into that room, right? And it was a big reminder to me that my gaze should be on love, not on everything that I have to get done. Oh. It'll get done or it won't. Right. But I know that if I love, that will get done with a beautiful piece of artwork. I think yeah. that's tremendous. I actually think that's tremendous. And and what it does then, of course, it shifts the neural pathways in your brain to start thinking differently and being able to be differently. When we think differently, we feel differently, we act differently. Right, right. So you're creating this whole beautiful kind of dance with all of these things just by shifting your gaze from this sucks to, ooh, what is this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I spend my days here with COVID asking that a lot. What is this? Because we not only have all of the natural disasters happening in the world, we have breakdowns in cultures, we have breakdowns in families, we're having breakdowns in political parties and institutions and, and differing ideas about this, that, or the other. We're fighting over what people should do with their own bodies reproductively, medically, all of these things. And so you can look at all of that and be frightened and be in the fear of that vortex, or you can remove yourself a little bit from it and look at it with curiosity and say, what is this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And, and what do I want to do in this? How do I want to contribute? Do I want to, to add to the noise and the yelling and the condescension and the rage and the all of that? Or do I want to shift my gaze to the billboard that just says love? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And after I got tired of reading love, I changed it to be kind. Got it. Wow. I love that. Right? And if mm -hmm. I had stayed longer, I had two more planned. Um, and the first one was play well with others. Ooh, I like that. And the last one was give. Oh. And with the little monikers of time, money, and love. Oh. And so I think just having these little like signposts that you're just going to follow when you feel like, oh my, I just can't take this anymore. And I want what I had back. Too bad you don't get it back. Hmm. We are in the serenity prayer now, right? Grant me the serenity to accept that what I cannot change. I cannot change that we are not back. And the chances of us going back anytime soon, slim to none. And the longer that we're not there, I would say people will want less to go back. Because in the mystery of this moment, there are shifts in how you're going to want to live. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that's not true because we've got theaters to fill. We've got shows to create. Yes. We've got events to produce. <laughs> yes. And here's how I play with that idea for myself, right? That is all true. And in the moment of the show must go on, which is where we were, mm -hmm. and now COVID proved the show can't go on. So in the moment of the show must go on, we never had enough moments to stop and really think, what show do we want to be putting up? Ah, what show do we want to be putting up and how are we going to do it now? Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. how do we do it? So that the next moment isn't saying, well, after COVID, we just went back to what was. But after COVID, there was a renaissance. There was a rebirth. There was a reimagining. There was a taking advantage of this pause and loving this pause so much that you're going to be sorry when it's over. Mm. I understand. <laughs> such an interesting concept it's such it's a very very powerful concept it really is yeah and it takes practice it's not easy because we're practiced it the other way right right exactly we're very well practiced the other way yeah. Vicky shared I have two words imagined and live a good life I yeah. love that imagine and live a good life that's beautiful absolutely, absolutely. now okay. Kate how can people find you I want to post your website Yay. So uh, my website is thekatechapman.com. And it's not because I have an ego trip. It's because I could not buy the domain katechapman.com. Well, I mean, I could, but $20,000, I would have had to like take out some sort of a loan to do that. And I thought that was not a good way to do it. So thekatechapman.com, I could get. So I am the one, which is good, actually, because when you Google Kate Chapman, there are a number of Kate Chapmans in the world doing really lovely things. I have to say, I'm very impressed with other Kate Chapmans. Oh, good. Yeah. I have really liked what I've seen out in the world. So good. Go Kate Chapmans. Yeah, um, Kate Chapmans, but, but I'm more, you're right, to experience more of Kate, this Kate Chapman's work, go yes. to the Kate Chapman. Dot com. Yes. And you've got all kinds of fun things that you're doing on your website and different classes and all kinds of fun things that you're doing. I'm not doing classes so much okay. yet. I'm, I mean, I'm doing private classes where organizations are inviting me in to do that. So I've been doing those, but I haven't been throwing my own classes right now. Um, I am doing private coaching and I have some limited slots um, and, and that's really so much fun. Uh, and then also on YouTube, I have a channel, just Kate Chapman, where I model really um, constant creative response. So that's that's yeah. the thing that I run my life by, is how do I have constant creative response? Um, and I didn't know that I did that until I met Liz Gilbert. And she told me I did that. 
Ooh, I know, it's so exciting. I and, love Liz. I know, I love her too. For my 50th birthday present for myself, and this was right before COVID, I um, took myself to a conference where she was speaking and it was so that I could sing to her the song that I wrote inspired by Big Magic. Oh, that's excellent. Oh, she must have loved that. She loved it. She laughed in all the right places. Um, and it's it's one of my favorite songs in the whole world. I will sing it for you if you want. Oh, I would love to hear it. Okay, okay. ladies and gentlemen, we are getting a performance by the Kate Chapman. Okay, so let me say the book Big Magic is all about creativity. Creativity, exactly. Uh -huh. And about really just doing it, right? Yeah. Don't take it so seriously, just do it. And so after I read that book, I it really helped my um, ability to play with my creativity. And I wrote this song as part of my Super Soul Song book, which is uh, what I call all the songs that I've written from watching Oprah's Super Soul Sunday. And, um, and it's called Hymn Number Three, like H-Y-M-N. And um, if you don't know what a blue-footed booby is, this is a lot of explanation that suddenly I needed to give. The blue-footed blue booby is a bird that lives in the Galapagos Islands, and they always hatch two babies, but they only ever end up raising one. Okay. And that's because the, the sibling always kicks the one out. The stronger siblings survive. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay, so that's what you need to know about the song. Blue footed. Oh, uh, wait, hold on. That wasn't the key. One, okay, fine. Blue footed booby mustn't feel bad at all when a chick gets kicked out of the nest because it's small. No. Blue footed booby mustn't feel bad at all. It's just nature's way. Blue footed booby mustn't feel bad at all when she looks at her two chips and thinks which one goes. Y'all, no. It gets kicked out, she watches it as it crawls away to its <laughs> certain death. But hey, it won't have to be a booby for long. And it inspired this fun song. That's nice, right? Yeah. Baby creativity is like baby boobies and you have to set some free. Maybe it's not seriously as hard as we make it out to be. Booby oh, mustn't feel bad at all when a chick gets kicked out of the nest because it's small. No, blue footed booby mustn't feel bad at all. It's just nature's way but hey it won't have to be a booby for long and it inspired this fun song that's nice right yeah. and <laughs> nature's way oh. <laughs> oh my god ass that is fabulous i don't know that i've ever done an interview with anybody that sang that sang a song for me and that an original song no less Inspired by Elizabeth Gilbert. Elizabeth Gilbert, yeah. I love that. That is just fabulous, Kate. And on that note, everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today with thekatechapman.com. Check out her book, A Pixie, no wait, A Pixie's Perspective on Life. No, it's A Pixie's, it's a terrible title I've come to realize. I may change it someday, but for now. A Pixie's Prescription, a fun toolkit for a feel better life. But you have to sing the subtitle. That's what I You love. do. Because I've also discovered that. you can't speak the subtitle. You cannot speak the subtitle. All right. So go check that out. Go check her website out. All kinds of fun things she's doing. And she does have a few slots left to be a client of hers as you're doing life coaching, which is fantastic. All right, excellent. All right, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you soon. It was fun. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Miss Kate. Thank you.